All right, last week, last week uh, our sermon was from Ratatouille. We had a couple from Ratatouille. And, uh, and that one was about, uh, about following the recipe. And, uh, and, and so we talked about how uh, the way that many churches were following the recipe has caused incredible division in our churches. Because each group would approach the, the New Testament looking for a command or an example or necessary inference, and from that they would extrapolate a recipe. And this would be God's authorized, commanded, formalized worship commands. And so they would have the recipe. But the church across town or down the street or in another town also would approach the Bible, the New Testament, with looking for commands and examples and necessary inferences and, and, and extrapolate God's authorized worship thing and, and end up with another recipe that was close but different. And then they would fight because you're not following God's authorized, commanded worship stuff. And this repeated over and over and over, over a hundred issues, dividing the church and causing division. This is fact. Something as simple as a church decided you can't have a kitchen. I went to a church like that for a couple years. It decided you can't have a kitchen. If you have a kitchen, the, the New Testament does not say you should build a kitchen under your church building. So you can't have a kitchen. And if you have a kitchen, you're like Nadab and Abihu and you're going to get zapped. And God doesn't like you because you're not following his commands. But by the same reasoning, your church building has no authority for bathrooms. Or even a church building, for that matter. <laughs> right? I mean, we're not thinking. Same thing, somebody says, you know, the New Testament doesn't authorize you to have a, a praise team up here. You, you're not allowed to have multiple song leaders. The New Testament doesn't say to do that. It doesn't say to have a single song leader either. Multiply that a hundred times. Dividing the church over our authorized pattern of worship because we've got the right recipe. It's destroying people. It's destroying the influence of the church. And so last week we noted that Jesus is the pattern. He's the recipe. I appreciate what Fred was saying at the communion table. When Jesus said, who do people say I am? And Peter said, you're the Christ, Son of the living God. And, and he says, yes. And, 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 and you're Peter, literally uh, the, physical, the, uh, the masculine there, you're like a stone easily moved. You're kind of wishy-washy, Peter. But on this rock, he uses a feminine form, and he's like, this massive declaration that I am the Son of God, I am the Messiah, I'm going to build my church. The word church there really is assembly. Church is, we think of church, we think of the building and property and the institution, organization. It's not what Jesus said. He said assembly. There were many assemblies then. If you were part of the Moose Lodge or the Elks Lodge or, or you, had, you had a bowling league, those were all assemblies. Of course, they didn't have those names then, but they had something, right? <laughs> but if you were part of those group, you were part of an, you were part of an ecclesia. Based, you, were, you were together based on a common sort of, maybe you had the same political clout. Maybe the same social standing or financial standing. Or maybe you had the same interest in some kind of craft. Those all became groups or ecclesia that you could belong to. But Jesus said, mine's going to be different because it's not going to be based on us and them. My ecclesia is going to be everyone can be part of it who sees that I am the Son of God. And, and Fred said that, that causes us to make a choice. It does because if you're going to say he's Messiah, if you're going to say he's Lord, then he's Lord and you're not. Right? And so now, now it, it imposes upon us a choice. Is he my Lord? And if he's my Lord, and he's the very Son of God, then I have to recognize he's revealing God to me. He's helping me become what God always wanted me to be, to become like God, to be, live in the image of God, because he is the radiance of God's glory, the exact representation of God's being, uh, the Hebrew writer tells us. Uh, uh, Colossians says, he is the image of the invisible God. Jesus said, if you've seen me, you've seen the Father. And so, here's... God with us, showing us who God created us to be. 
That calls us, if, if we want him to be Lord, it calls us into this path of becoming like him. That's Jesus' assembly. That's what his assembly was all about. So, we're going to move from Ratatouille. Today, our lesson is going to be from... You saw it in your, bullet, your program, right? From Dory, from Finding Dory. And I, it takes a village is not anything political statement. It's not about making the government run, raise my kids or anything like that. It's just a catchy phrase that you've heard of. But God knew from the beginning that it takes a village. Both of these stories, both uh, Finding Dory and Finding Nemo, both of those stories are a story about somebody finding their way home. Isn't that the gospel story? About God providing a way for us to find our way home? And in both of these stories, there are all kinds of characters involved in the person either finding their way home or finding their way back to the relationship with the parents and, and reconnecting with everybody. All of that. All of that happens because other people are involved. It takes a village. And that's where we're going to be getting from Dory. Um, I have a video clip here. I'm sure it works. We had gremlins again in the electronics here. Uh, oh my goodness, it was really tough this morning. But let's just see. But let me tell you what's going on. In that clip I had there, it was part of sort of toward the end of the, of the uh, story where uh, uh, Dory and some others actually are trying to rescue now Nemo and his dad who ended up on some truck uh, on their way to some uh, facility and they're trying to get them back to their home in the ocean, trying to get them back to their friends. And, and all these people get involved. The otter, those are otters. I had to ask Mackenzie. Those are otters up there? Uh, they're otters up there, right? Yeah, yeah. So the otters go, I didn't have it in the clip, but the otters go up on the freeway they, and they, they hug each other and look so cute that nobody wants to run them over. So they stop the truck. Uh, but anyway, so Hank, this octopus is driving this truck and, uh, and Dory's uh, sitting up in her makeshift uh, aquarium jar and, uh, and, and, they're tr and, and they're trying to get back to the ocean. And, uh, and just before this, all these other guys, like the beluga whale was using his uh, so echolocation or something, and I think that's a blue whale back there. The blue whale is actually the one that taught Dory how to speak whale. Did you know that? Um, the seals, I think, gave up their rock for a moment for something. Uh, but everybody's involved in this whole process. And in the scene I had, this truck... The octopus can't see, so Dory's telling him what to do. And he's just running over and bouncing over uh, uh, the guardrails and making hard swerves. And, and then he finds his way uh, through the woods back over into the ocean. The truck tips over and all the guys are released free. And they, they sort of make it back. And so it's accomplished. But, but my point was that it takes a village. Everybody's involved in this process of getting them to find their way home. It's, this, it's, in, it's inherent in these stories about what's going on. And so... And so I want to I say when we think about our, what is this about? Like, if it's not about some kind of a, a, a God-commanded ritual uh, worship or else thing, if it's not that, then what is it? Well, it, the, the, the New Testament is certainly about assemblies. It's all about assemblies, of course. But if it's not that, then what is it about? That's what I want to talk about today. And so here's one of our uh, favorite verses, but we ought to just take a close look at it. This is in Hebrews 10. Sorry about the bottom scripture bouncing out. It says, and let us consider how we may what? Spur one another on toward love and good deeds. Now, who do you know that was, is the most, the highest producer, the highest symbol of love and good deeds is Jesus. We, are, we, we ought to be spurring each other on to becoming like Jesus, not giving up meeting together as some of the habit of, uh, of doing. Uh, not Don't give up meeting together, but what? But encouraging one another and all the more as you see the day approaching. This is about meeting together. It's about the purpose and intent of meeting together. And what is the purpose and intent of meeting together in this passage? That we, as a family, as a body of Christ, would be spurring each other on, encouraging each other, lifting each other up, in, in whatever way we can, helping each other become the body of Christ. 
Um, you know, it, it goes on all the time. It goes on here. Uh, there, there's, a, there's a force here called the angel fund. Anybody ever hear that? It's not out of the church treasury. There's just this force that goes out and blesses people. Anybody in here been blessed by the angel fund? You look around, there's people who have been blessed for various reasons, just, just to be a blessing. Um, there's a group, the D-Dog group, that comes and, and beautifies and, and tries to make things look nice and keep this whole facility working. And they do great projects. Right? That's part of what it is. I'm encouraged by that. It's nice to see beautiful playground equipment instead of dilapidated. Anybody agree with that? All these little things. Um, there's, somebody, there's somebody who makes sure college students gets a little extra cash every month. Did you know that? If you ever, if you've been a, in, in the first, if you went to college or at least in recent days, I guess, or if you have somebody in college right now, you may be a recipient of that. It's, it just happens. People are blessing each other. Um, and, and there's more. We talk about all these kinds of ways that there's an interaction going on where we're blessing each other. And, and when you're talking about what the assembly is about, the assembly is about being in each other's lives, helping each other on that pathway home. And as a community of faith, being a place where other people can find a pathway home. There's this scene right here. Could you turn the lights on a little bit so we can get a little bit more contrast just for a minute? Can, every, can you guys see what's going on in here? Maybe turn that one off, yeah. This is a scene where the, the Hank, the octopus, octopus is actually driving the vehicle, and you can see his eye level. He can't see over the dashboard. And so here's Dory. She's up there, and, um, and she's in that little jar right there. And if you look closely, so here's Dory, right? What's this right here? Maybe it's a coffee cup holder or something, I don't know. But that jar does not fit very well in there. That jar is just sitting right on top. Anybody ever try that with an open cup of coffee? <laughs> How does that work? Especially if you know in the clip, which we didn't get to see, but he's steering like this and swerving and bouncing over guardrails. What should happen to that jar? It, there's no way it would stay there. But, but through the whole thing, that jar is just calmly sitting there till, of course, they go off into the ocean. But it's just calmly sitting there while, these, while all this craziness is going on. My family went a few weeks ago and visited Terry Payton in, in Irvine at the uh, Kaiser. And uh, she related to us, among other things, she was just telling us that where she expected, like normally in some of this uh, medical stuff, she would experience some stress and some anxiety, especially with all the not knowing what's going on and, and you know, especially with the broken femur, the prodding and the medical stuff and the bothering through the night. But, but in all of that, she expect, you know, she, she felt like she normally would have a, a significant level of stress and, and, and anxiety about all of that. And she said, but you know what? I've had this tremendous peace. Like all, all my circumstances around me just going crazy, you know, jumping guardrails and swerving. And, and I've had this tremendous peace. And she said she was talking to Phyllis Goodwin about it. Is Phyllis here? I don't know if I have the exact words here, Phyllis, but, but what she said was, she said, Phyllis, you know, I've just experienced this tremendous peace. And Phyllis said to her something like, what do you expect? Your family at Sunny Hills Church, everybody on the Internet, on Facebook, everybody's praying for you. Is that something like what you said? Yeah. And so she, she just, she said, look, you, you've been prayed for. And so in, in a way, you know, uh, uh, Terry's in there experiencing this, this presence of God. But it's not alone. It's, it's not all by herself in her own little cubicle with God. She's part of a community of faith where people are caring about her and praying for her and visiting her, and many of you did. And that's, that's, that's what causes us to be able to have this kind of peace through the storm because she's part of a community of faith, a village. It takes a village. And so, I better skip out of there. There we go. And so all these guys... We need all of them in our lives as we're trying to find this journey home. We need one another. And the Bible actually describes sort of this. I mean, how many different animals are there? And, and, and in the story, there's like, there's a bird that helps them. And, and there's, there's others. There, there's all kind of creatures that help them uh, get Dory home. Okay? And this is like our relationship. This is why, this is what this whole group is about. Biblically. It's what it's about. Right here. This is uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 14. What shall we say, brothers and sisters? 
When you come together, what are we talking about? Assemblies. Are we talking about assemblies? He's been talking about assemblies for a long time in the, by this time. Uh, all, even all the way back in chapter 11, he's talking about assemblies and about uh, head covering stuff. But he goes on to say, your assemblies are not that great. Why? Because you don't love each other. You don't care about the poor. You go ahead and eat up all your food and you're not sharing and you don't care about them. You don't realize that you as one, you as a group are the body of Christ. And in all of chapter 12, it's talking about how you're the body of Christ. And somebody's a beluga whale and somebody's a blue whale and somebody's an otter and somebody's a clownfish. That may not be funny. Um, but you know, he, but he describes everybody as having a place in this kind of, or, not organization, but organism. A living body of Christ. And you are all members of that body as you take your place to bless and, and encourage each other. And so here Paul in 14 says, oh yeah, that, so then chapter 12, then 13 says it's all about love. It doesn't matter anything you do or whatever gift you have, if you don't have love, then what good is it? It's no good. And then chapter 14, all the way through this chapter, if we were to take the time to read through it, over and over and over, Paul will say again and again, I want what you're doing to edify others. When you come together, your purpose is to build up the church. And here's what he says. What shall we say, brothers and sisters? When you come together, each of you has a hymn or a word of instruction or a revelation or a tongue or an interpretation. God has given each one of you something to, to participate in being part of the body of Christ. But what does he say there at the end? Everything must be done. What's the focus of what we're doing in an assembly here? Everything must be done so that, and again, that word church, it's the word assembly. Uh, I think I've told you this before. Our English word church does not go back to ecclesia in the Greek. It goes back to kuriakos, meaning belonging to the Lord. And kuriakos is not the word translated church in the text. It really shouldn't be that word. When we think of church, we might think of buildings, we might think of institutions, we might think of, you know, uh, organizations. But that's not what it says. Everything must be done so that the ecclesia, the assembly, the same word used for Israel in the wilderness or around the uh, tabernacle. That's the congregation of God. It's the same word. Everything must be done that the assembly of the body of Christ might be energized, lifted up, empowered to be the body of Christ, the community of faith, the village, the family of God. Uh, Connor was here last week and he, he, he noted to me later, he said, well, there's that one place where it talks about sort of like worship service. Because I told you, you could do a word search and, not, and you won't find the New Testament talking about a worship service the way we talk about it. And you won't. You may find in James, in one translation, like God's word translation, you'll find where the word synagogue is interpreted worship service. But it's the word synagogue. Everywhere else translates synagogue. Uh, but here in Romans 12, there's something close to the idea of worship service. But you see, uh, this is not talking about an hour on Sunday as we look at it. You'll see that. I appeal to you, for, uh, bro therefore, brothers, by the mercies of God to do what? To present your bodies a living sacrifice. How many of us hear priestly language here? Anybody hearing priestly language? Who offers sacrifices? Who presents sacrifices to God? The priests do. Peter calls us a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people belonging to God. We are a royal priesthood. What are our sacrifices? Paul says, I want you to offer your bodies, all of you individually offer your bodies. And the NIV had this wrong before. They fixed it in 2011. Because it used to say, offer your bodies as living sacrifices. So each one of you was a body that was offered as a living sacrifice. But that's not what Paul's saying. Paul says, I want each one of you to offer each of your bodies as what? What does it say? A living sacrifice. It's singular. Because in Paul's mind, he's envisioning that as all of us 
are living sacrificially, when we offer ourselves to Jesus as Lord, where we say we want to be like you and we want to help each other be like you, when we say that, we become the body of Christ. And so we together are the living body of Christ. Because we are offering ourselves as sacrifices to that. And so he says, he says, offer yourselves as this living sacrifice, holy and pleasing to God, which is your, and here's the word, your spiritual worship, or the old King James, I think, said reasonable service, or some uh, ASV, I think, said your uh, service of worship, or one might say logical service. Why are they all so different? Because the word worship here is not this word uh, proskuneo, where it's prostration. It's not this word. Uh, this word is the cultic or priestly word for worship. When the priest got together daily to offer the sacrifices or burn the incense or do all the stuff a priest is supposed to do, that's called latreion. I mean, that's the noun form. It's, it's called the, the latreion. That is the priestly service. The, uh, the performing of the sacred services, the offering of gifts, the worshiping of God in the, in the manner that he's instituted for his worship. That's what those priests were doing when they were doing those daily rituals for the Jews. What's our worship? What's our priestly worship? See, somewhere along the line, somebody relegated it to an hour on Sunday. And they said, all these things are holy commandments and holy worship, and that's what God wants. But that's not what the New Testament says. The New Testament says your worship is when you're living as a sacrifice, offering yourself to be part of a community of faith, the very body of Christ. You're a priest, every one of you, every one of us. And we offer ourselves to God so that he can incorporate us into the body of Christ and that Jesus can be alive right here to help all of us on our pathway home so that we can also be a shining beacon to anybody out there who can find their pathway home. That's what it means to be the body of Christ. That's our worship. And he goes on to say, for just as each of us has one body with many members, and these members do not have the same function, so in Christ we do what? We form one body. That's what he was saying. Offer yourselves a living sacrifice. Offer your bodies as a living sacrifice. How do you do it? Right here. By, by understanding that we're all different. Like I said, one of, us is a, one of us is a seal, and one of us is an otter, and one of us is a beluga whale, and one of us is a, I don't know what dory is. Angelfish, right? Anyway, that's, that's the family of God, all of us having our different uh, gifts, and using those to bless and spur and encourage and lift up, energize this body of Christ so that we can be a light for anybody who else is trying to find their way home. That's what worship is about in the New Testament. That's what it actually says. I know it's not the way we've thought about it, but you did not hire me 10 years ago to tell you the way we've thought about it. I'm just telling you that. I'm trying to tell you what I find in the text, and this is what's in the text. And so it takes a village. Uh, Peter, Peter who talks about you're a royal priest of the holy nation, a people belong to God. He's the one that says, each of you should use whatever gift you receive to serve others as faithful stewards of God's grace in his various forms. Whatever gift we've received, we're supposed to be using for one another. This is a common theme in the New Testament. It's what it says over and over. So if anybody speaks, they should do it as one speaking the very words of God. If anybody serves, they should serve with the strength God provides. So that what? So that in all things, God may be praised through Jesus Christ. You want to bring glory to God? You want to bring glory to God? Then worship God in this way. Worship God by figuring out which one of those, you know, fish or whatever, or whales or whatever they are. Whales, of course, aren't fish. Figure out which creature you are. Figure out what your place in the body of Christ is and offer that to God. There are so many opportunities to do that here. Uh, I want to return back to this. This is the heart of what I'm saying. 
Our assembly is that we lift each other up and spur each other on to be the body of Christ. And the, the, the Sunny Hills Church, can you read all these? Yeah, that's not bad, the lighting. That's just a sampling of, of ways that you can find your place. Linda Cicino wrote a whole thing about all the different ministries and who's leading them and how you can get involved. You really want to worship God? You really want to uh, be a, be, be, uh, perform your priestly duty and, and do your priestly worship? It's being involved in, in, in all these ways that, you, that he's gifted you. And some of those may be in the Sunday service, you can see it up there, or maybe the Unite service, or, or across the street. Uh, uh, Roger, does anybody know that you're going to be leaving us? Then I won't tell them. <laughs> can I tell them? I... I I'm sorry. Uh, so Roger's moving to Texas, right? We don't want him to move to Texas. He'll be here one more Sunday, I think, and he's going to be leaving like on the 9th. We don't want him to go. Uh, uh, but Roger has been faithfully going across the street on the fourth Sundays for the Senior Living Center, the Sunrise Assisted Living Center. I put service. Yeah, the, the, the service we provide over there. Um, I do the third Sundays. The youth do, do the, the youth do the fifth Sundays. Uh, some of you do the first Sundays, and some of you do the second Sundays faithfully. And Roger's been faithful to do the fourth, but he's going to be leaving. So, who is it? God has blessed somebody. You don't have to preach a whole sermon. Uh, I think Roger always prepared a nice lesson for them. Thank you for doing that. But you can just sing some songs and, and provide the Lord's Supper. Uh, sometimes when I go on the third Sunday, it's just me. Sometimes it's me and, and Nathan Guerrero. Where's Nathan? Is he out upstairs? Yeah, there he is. Thank you, Nathan. Sometimes it's just me and Nathan. Sometimes Tabitha goes. A lot of times some of the other kids, Mackenzie used to go. But, um, but if that's going to happen, then it's, it's you, whoever you are, right? And same thing with all of these. These don't happen unless you become part of the body of Christ. And, and look at all that's up here. I, I can see easy. Back there is not great for me. Uh, Blanky ministry. Oh, my goodness. There were people. Dot sent me a, a note. Uh, she had to clean out one of her uh, storage units. And she had like five or more people, uh, old and young. I'm not going to say which ones were the old ones. Okay, young and those who were not quite as young were there emptying out this entire storage bin of all this material and helping her do that. Doc's been doing amazing. She just had surgery. She can't empty the thing. How's it going to get emptied? Because there's people who are part of the body of Christ doing their thing. Blanky ministry doing great things. Uh, Pathway of Hope, if you're given to the food bank over there. Sunny Seniors, we had a nice meal on, on Thursday here. You can be involved in that. They have a donation thing where they raise money to, uh, for different uh, uh, things, um, different needs. Uh, growth groups, please come to our growth groups. I have, I have uh, several signed up for the uh, Old Testament tonight. Donna Downer's house, we're going to meet at 6 o'clock. Um, so we'll be there at 6, be there at 6 o'clock. Uh, and then, actually, mine did not start last week. It starts tonight. And the Helen starts next Saturday night. Uh, you're welcome. Even if, even if you didn't sign up, just let them know. Or don't let them know. Just show up. But be a part of the growth group. That is part of your priestly service. It's part of helping encourage and spur one another on. That text said, and all the more. And I don't know if he's saying meet all the more or just encourage one another all the more. But either way, it's all the more. To get involved in these things. Vicente Guerrero, great work there. Uh, chili cook-off's coming up. There's a cleanup sheet out there too. If you don't want to cook chili, you don't want to judge chili, then sign up to help clean up. Some of you have. Thank you for that. Uh, our musical is a huge program, and many of you are involved. Thank you very much for that. But all of these things. And this isn't all of them. But, but church, to put a fine point on it, being the body of Christ is not going to a church service and punching your ticket and say, I hope God's pleased with me because I did it right. Sorry. That is not following Jesus. And following Jesus also isn't just being individually, like in your own cubicle, a spiritual person. I'm, I'm a, I believe in God. I'm a spiritual person, but I don't believe in being part of an assembly. It's not true. The Bible describes Christianity, dis describes disciples of Christ as being this interwoven, interconnected, intergenerational, intercultural, uh, everything. There's, it's all we. There's no us and them. And it's the body of Christ using its gifts 
to worship, to serve God by blessing one another. And so that's my encouragement for you. Find your place. Find your place. That will cause a church to grow. Find your place.